Our, our next presenter is, uh, is on the infrastructure team uh, with the Python Software Foundation amongst the various other bits of engineering raconteuring that he generally does. Uh, today he's going to be presenting us with alternatives to writing passwords on your computer screen. Uh, please make welcome Noah Kantrovitz. All right, so uh, as, as Chris mentioned before, if you saw this talk yesterday, it's the same talk, I promise. No hard feelings if you want to escape. Um, uh, I am primarily known in the Chef community. I still do a lot of work in the Python world, but most of my professional life is in Chef these days. I'm Cantron on Twitter and Code Ranger everywhere else. I work for Bloomberg on generic open source liaison and ecosystem stuff. Um, and to lead off, this, this talk is going to be about secrets as they pertain to infrastructure. This is not a talk about browser extensions or writing secure Django code. Um, if you want my advice on those, one password or story passwords using PBKBF2 respectively. But again, no hard feelings if you want to escape because this is about infrastructure. All right, so let's lead in. What defines a secret in terms of infrastructure? You could treat all private information as secret, like user data and stuff like that, but it gets really unwieldy really fast. So we're gonna use these three properties to lock down exactly what's going to be a secret. So the first thing is it has to be small. You might use techniques like disk encryption or database encryption to use a small secret to control access to a larger amount of data, but the secret part itself is relatively small. Second, it's gonna be radioactive. So if an attacker knows it, something bad happens. If you compare a username and a password, for example, if an attacker knows your username, you don't usually consider it a big deal, but if they know your password, that's a problem. The password's the radioactive one, so that's the secret. And finally, it's gotta be required. These days when we talk about microservices and service-oriented architecture, there's a lot of discussion of graceful fallback and degradation and things like that. As your services start to, to fall over, things should keep functioning. Secrets are usually immune from that. They are required for your infrastructure to function. If your Django app doesn't have a database password, it's not gonna do anything, sorry. Um, there's four types of secrets we're gonna use as guiding use cases. When I talk about passwords in this talk, again, infrastructure, so we're talking about things that are machine to machine or server to server, but with passwords, it's usually things that were designed for humans first. So for example, Postgres and MySQL, they use a username and password. They were originally designed for a human to log into a database, but these days it's generally going to be an application logging into your database. Passwords are small, usually under one kilobyte of data, and they're some sort of single word, be it you know multiple actual words, but it's, it's a single string in, in common use. Um, they're usually just gonna be ASCII, if you want to go beyond that, go for it. Some examples, like I mentioned, SQL passwords, HTTP proxy passwords, or Linux login passwords. To contrast that, we have tokens. Tokens are usually, instead of things that were built for humans, they're things built for server-to-server -server interaction from the ground up. Um, you also can't cheat with passwords. You can sometimes store a hash of a password. With a token, it needs to be in its raw form to be usable. Other than that, they're relatively similar to passwords. Some examples include API credentials for, say, PagerDuty, or OAuth access credentials. And then again, to compare, keys are gonna be much larger than tokens and passwords. They usually have some kind of internal formatting, new lines, the, the dash, 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 RSA, private key, header, stuff like that. They have sort of internal structure that matters. TLS keys, SSH keys, that kind of thing. And then after that, there's this long tail of miscellaneous. Sometimes some of the miscellaneous things look enough like one of the other three to make it work. So like Kerberos machine tickets, they look kind of like key files, just with some specialized administration commands around the edges, like kadmin and, and whatnot. But other stuff like PCI log records, you can't use any of these tools for that. You've gotta look at dedicated secrets management tools for that specific task. So be aware that occasionally you will need to look outside the box at dedicated tools and that's okay. So we know what types of secrets we're talking about. Let's take their temperature. Hot secrets or online secrets are things that are needed during the normal operation of your infrastructure, and they need to be used and, and manipulated autonomously. So for example, you have a Flask web app. If a human had to sit at the console and type in the database password every time a new web request came in, your app's not gonna get a whole lot of work done. So that is an example of something where it needs to be available for the application to use whenever it wants without human interaction. To compare, we have cold or offline secrets, which are things that are secret, they're important. We need to store them for a long, piece, a long uh, period of time, but we don't necessarily need them every day or every minute. Uh, so for example, AWS master account passwords or revocation certificates. These are things that we can put behind a bit more of a wall to get to. The hot versus cold dichotomy is rarely 100% clear in practice. 
uh, most small uh, application clusters, let's say, you're going to need to have human interaction to boot a new server into your web app pool, but once the server is running, it needs to run autonomously. So it starts sort of hot, or it starts sort of cold, and then it goes to the hot side. And then within online or hot secrets, there's another subspectrum related to how often the secret changes. Most traditional uh, hot secret management systems are built around slow secrets. Once set, a secret usually only changes either because of an emergency, like some kind of compromise, or to comply with industry regulations like PCI DSS, which says you have to rotate your keys every six months. Uh, so rotating a slow secret is usually a human-initiated action, and it's something that's complicated enough that you don't want to do it every day. Biggest example is TLS keys and certificates. We all know these change. Uh, they change maybe every year, every two years, but day to day you think of a TLS key and certificate as being relatively static data, and you probably manage and treat them as you would any other static file. Some newer secrets platforms are bringing in the idea of fast automatic rotation. So for example, OCSP stapling, which is basically like automatically regenerating your certificate every 15 minutes, or uh, EC2 roll credentials, which reset every six hours. Uh, within reason, the more often a secret is rotated, the more secure you're going to be. If there had been a brute force or a, a code leak of some kind that you weren't aware of yet, every time you rotate the secret, you reset the clock. Uh, that said, the fast rotation does usually require more coordination between the secret consumer and the secret management platform because the consumer has to understand you know, TTL values, expiration timers, and how to refresh the data. So that's properties of secrets. Let's talk about properties of secrets management systems. The principle of least access or principle of least privilege, at least as it pertains to computer science, is generally attributed to Jerry Saltzer in a 1974 ACM paper. It's mostly common sense, but it's so often ignored that it bears strenuous repetition. In short, a service or tool should have access only to the secrets it requires and nothing else. Quality of every secrets management platform should always be judged on these two principles first. Uh, how, how well can it implement principle of least privilege, and then how much audit information is recorded when something goes wrong. Something will go wrong at some point, and you're going to want to know what was accessed, when, how, and where. Other features are important in specific tools, and we'll talk about those later. They'll make or break your use case for specific tools and techniques, but always start with an examination of these two properties. All right, let's do it. Let's manage some secrets. Cool, bam, done, we can all go home, right? <laughs> All right, we've all done this. I've done this plenty of times. And we knew it was a bad idea, but maybe not why it was a bad idea. Uh, what we've done breaks both of our guiding principles. We've permanently linked the privilege of able to clone the repository with the privilege of can read database password. On top of that, we have no audit logging. At best, maybe we have a, li a list of who cloned the repository from the Git server. But beyond that, we have no idea who accessed the password. So all in all, not a good idea. We have a strong feeling at this point that we want to make things better, uh, but we have to figure out how we're going to improve things. So the next, port, the, next port, uh, the next point that you need to look at is threat modeling. Figure out what the attack surfaces are, uh, how you're going to defend them, and what a successful attack against each surface would bring to the table. The eight major levels that I use are here. Again, I'm not talking about web app security. There's a lot of things inside your Django or Flask or whatever application that you need to deal with. I'm mostly looking at infrastructure level protections. Brute force, simplest one. If you're on the internet, you see a nonstop parade of these on all the major ports. The simplest solutions to these are the three R's. Rate limit access, things like logins or API use, especially if it's invalid use, put rate limits on those. Restrict access, so if you're, say, using a database server for an internal web app, don't put the database server on the internet. It doesn't need to be there. Put it on an internal subnet, firewall it off, whatever. If it's not on the internet, it's not going to be subject to this massive wave of brute force. Uh, and finally, rotate your secrets. If it takes three years to brute force something and you rotate it every 15 minutes, well, not really a big deal. And then finally, you can use techniques or technologies that are currently beyond brute forcing, like say 4096-bit RSA keys. But remember that's always going to be a moving target and uh, traffic or data that's stolen or recorded now could potentially be decrypted in the future. All right, next up, weakest threat uh, as of all of these is a code leak. Taking aside the effects to the business, which may be considerable but aren't my problem as an ops person, uh, hopefully this isn't going to be a big deal for security. We all know we shouldn't hard code passwords into our source code, so somebody oopsing on GitHub shouldn't be a big deal. This can also happen more subtly over time. Things like debug pages will usually reveal one line of source code at a time, and if an attacker is smart enough, they can manipulate your stack traces to figure out the lines of code that they need. Uh, but overall, like I said, shouldn't really be a big deal. Next up is a backup leak. So if you remember the Instagram hack from about a year ago, that was one of these. Uh, they put a backup file up on S3 and promptly forgot about it, and it had live credentials in it. Uh, 
in general, there's a couple things you need to do here. One, audit your backup system. Figure out what you are backing up every time and take a look and see if you can prune stuff out of it. Uh, make sure you update your config files, block lists of files and things to avoid backing up. Uh, and then also consider using techniques that will not put uh, things into files. If it's only ever stored in RAM, then it can't be caught in a backup system. Traversal attacks, you know, this is usually, when you see, when you hear traversal, you're thinking directory traversal, but from an infrastructure point of view, traversal is anything where the application has legitimate access to a secret, but an attacker shouldn't. So for example, your database password, your application needs real access to that. It needs to get the database password to connect the database, but a user using your web app shouldn't have access to that database password. So things like SQL injection, directory traversal, all of those fall into the same category. And here is really where good web app security shines. You know, make sure that your app is well written such that they can't extract files or do SQL injection. Hopefully that's not news to anyone here. Uh, I will mention a frequent traversal style attack takes advantage of the fact that a lot of people these days store secrets and tokens in environment variables. The 12 factor manifesto from Heroku even goes so far as calling this a best practice. I disagree. So big problem with this is uh, of things like debug pages and error logs, like say Sentry, they usually capture all local environment variables and ship them off in plain text to sit in a log file somewhere. <laughs> so yes, most of these are configurable and you can probably prevent them from showing individual environment variables, but if you ever forget one, you know, all that work you did to protect that valuable API token is all now moot because it's chilling over in plain text somewhere you're not watching carefully. So be careful with these, I consider them unsafe at any speed. All right. Next up on uh, attack surfaces, code execution. We've moved beyond the bounds of good web app security. No matter how awesome your internal Django security is, they can run code, so all of that is completely moot. So here we fall back on structural protections. Principle of least access is the most important thing. If the web app didn't have access to a secret, there is no possible way that an attacker could get access to it. Things like uh, using file permissions, dropping privileges as a service, using Linux containers, all can help here. When Dante passes through the gates of hell, he reads an inscription, abandon all hope ye who enter here. Once you have root execution, basically all local protections are void. Containers, yeah, that's fantastic, doesn't help anymore. Um, I, I'm sure somebody somewhere has been told that Docker will protect you in this case, it will not. Uh, here is where audit trails really start to matter. You want to see exactly what was accessed and when, so you know exactly what secrets you need to go rotate. Another commonly ignored attack surface is laptop theft. At most small companies, access to a developer workstation gives you root on every server. Fortunately, laptops are used by humans, not other servers, so we can use techniques like disk encryption, where you can have an encryption password that the person never tells anyone else. Uh, if you're not already using disk encryption on all your developer machines, you should probably be doing that. And then finally, the nebulous higher power attack surface. So where a lot of people draw the line on planning, either voluntarily or because they have industry regulations, like for me, I work in the financial services industry, we can't tell the US Federal Bureau of Investigation to smack off, it's just not an option. Uh, but there's this you know, cascading list, things like FISA court warrants, advanced persistent threats, natural disasters, who knows, figure out what your response is going to be, even if that response is, I don't know, I'm gonna find a new job. <laughs> All right. So those are our eight attack surfaces. Let's talk a little bit about some of the cryptography that's involved. First up, symmetric versus asymmetric cryptography. Hopefully this is not news for everyone, but just as a quick review, we start with a secret, we generate a random key, we use the key to encrypt the secret, we get some kind of encrypted blob that can't be read. We transfer the key over to the server, we transfer the encrypted blob over to the server, the server uses the key to decrypt the encrypted blob and get back our secret. Fairly simple use of symmetric encryption. This is things like AES, et cetera. To compare that, we have asymmetric cryptography where we start with a secret. We generate a public private key pair on the server. We retrieve the public key. We use the public key to generate an encrypted blob. We send the encrypted blob over to the target server and it decrypts to the secret. This is important because there's a couple of different main modes of secrets management tools. Um, the three are symmetric pre-encryption, asymmetric pre-encryption, and trusted third party. So symmetric pre-encryption, as you would imagine, uses symmetric cryptography. Again, we have a, a secret and a random key. We use the key to encrypt the secret. We throw the key onto the machines that should have access. So in this case, only two of the servers are being given access to the secret. We put the encrypted blob up on some kind of storage system, maybe S3 or an internal database or a chef server, or maybe it's copying directly, but some kind of, of less secure or authenticated storage mechanism because the encrypted blob can't be read. We don't really care who has access to it. 
And then the servers, they can all download the encrypted blob, but only the ones with the key get access to the secret. To compare this with asymmetric pre-encryption, we generate a key pair on all of the machines. We copy all of the public keys up to the storage system. We retrieve those public keys onto our admin. We use each public key to generate a separate encrypted private copy. We copy all of those onto the storage system, copy those down onto the relevant machines, and then each server uses its private key to decrypt its corresponding encrypted copy. What this means is that asymmetric pre-encryption systems, because they have to generate a separate encrypted copy for each server, generally don't work with techniques like auto-scaling, because a new server boots up, it can generate a key, but there's not going to be an encrypted copy sitting and waiting for it in the storage system. To address that, we turn to trusted third-party systems. Now, what we have here instead is uh, the, the trusted third party will be given the secret in plain text. We might use transfer encryption or, or at rest encryption, but at heart, a trusted third party system gets access to all of the secrets in plain text in memory at runtime, but we attach a policy to it. And we say, only hand the secret out to servers B and C. And then it does that. So server D, it can access the secrets management system, but no matter what it does, it shouldn't get access to our secret. So we're giving it access to the entire universe of our secrets, and we're trusting its internal access controls to only do what we told it. All right, so with those definitions in mind, let's look at some specific tools. Starting from the top again, text files. We covered this already, so I won't dwell on it long. Usually this will take the form of either checking stuff into individual application repositories. Sometimes you'll see a Git repository just called secrets or keys. Or sometimes you'll have things just being SCP'd around manually, TLS keys. That's very often you get you know, a text file down from your CA and you just copy it onto each machine individually. Uh, but we've already talked about why this is bad, so moving on. Next step a lot of people reach for is I want it to be encrypted because encryption makes everything better, right? Cool. There's a lot of tools that do this that integrate with Git. Git Crypt is probably the best of them, so it's the one I'll talk about. It can be used in either symmetric or asymmetric modes, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the underlying problem with it, which is it's full of foot guns. Um, we've already talked about why Git doesn't really give us uh, good audit logs. So no matter what you do with all of the encryption in the world, it's not gonna give you a better audit log. And it also is a whitelist system generally, so if you forget to mark that a file needs to be encrypted, you'll accidentally just push it up in the clear to your Git repository, and then you get to deal with the lovely thing of finding that one question on Stack Overflow where you learn how to expunge data from a Git repository. We've all done it, admit it. All right, so next up, we don't wanna put stuff in Git. What else can we put them in? Well, we've got these cluster managers just lying around. They're key value stores. They've got ACLs, right? We can probably just put some data in them, right? Uh, this is okay. There's also tools that'll layer encryption onto this, but it doesn't really help anything. The core problem is that the ACLs on these systems are usually not wonderful. Console is okay, etcds I don't love. Zookeeper has a really powerful ACL system that I have literally never seen anyone implement correctly. Uh, so maybe this works for you, but I don't really recommend it just because it's so difficult to do right. So I'm active in the Chef world, like I said before, I see a lot of people reaching for Chef encrypted data bags because again, it says encryption on it. That'll just make everything better. Unfortunately, encrypted data bags are a symmetric system. So what we saw before is we have to generate that random key and then send the key to all of our servers so they can decrypt the encrypted blob. That key is itself a secret. So we're not really solving uh, encryption, or so we're not solving secrets management when we deal with symmetric pre-encryption systems, all we're doing is pushing down a level of recursion. That might be okay. It means that you have to solve key management once and doing it by hand once and then having a nice set of tools built on top of that might be okay if you don't start and stop servers very often, but be aware that you've probably still got this sort of secondary key management problem to solve. Ansible Vault is very similar to Chef uh, encrypted data bags, but it takes advantage of Ansible's push space nature. So instead of having to put the decryption key on every target machine, you only need it on the workstation of the person running Ansible push. But we still have the same problem. How does the person get that password? Did they copy it out of an internal wiki? Eh. All right. Uh, here, eEAML is the closest in, uh, analog to encrypted bags in Ansible Vault, but for the Puppet world, but instead it's a trusted third party system. So we're going to encrypt all of the secrets in a way that the Puppet Master can decrypt them, and then we're going to trust that the Puppet Master will only hand the secrets out to the people that we have said it should. How much you trust this should always be gut checked. I can say in this case the Puppet Master and here eEAML are fine, so I would trust that their internal ACLs are well implemented and safe, but if it's a brand new system, maybe go and look at how strong you think their ACL code is. 
And then uh, the last of the specific, uh, the, the CM specific tools is Chef Vault. This builds on top of encrypted data bags to build a key distribution system, taking advantage of the fact that Chef uses uh, RSA key pairs for API authentication. But again, we've got the same problem. Those key pairs themselves are secrets and we need to figure out how to manage them. Even uh, people that have used Chef for a lot of years probably don't know how to rotate their Chef client keys, so mm, beware. All right, leaving the realm of single CM tools, we've got HashCorp Vault. New kit on the block, relatively powerful and making a lot of waves. Um, it's a dedicated secrets management platform, so built from the ground up, has all of the features you'd expect, uh, granular ACLs, high quality audit logs, modular backends, all that nice stuff, and best of breed system for auto rotation of fast secrets. Slightly older but still solid is Square's KeyWiz. Um, it's got a more limited data model than HashCorp Vault, so it's uh, somewhat more difficult to use with uh, passwords and tokens. It really excels at keys through KeywizFS that we'll talk about in a second. But uh, because it's more limited, it's also been battle tested a lot harder. For people that are 100% AWS based and are never planning to leave, my personal recommendation is to use just a private S3 bucket and IAM permissions. Um, this can be a little bit difficult to configure and a lot of people end up writing fairly complex build and management scripts for it, but it means you don't have to run your own servers for any of this. It's all integrated into the Amazon ecosystem. Sort of separate from using just plain private S3, I should mention Amazon KMS. It's not itself a key management, or sorry, it's not itself a secrets management system. It's more of a key escrow system. Um, we'll look at a couple of tools that tie it into a full secrets management tool, but really imagine that instead of generating the key on your admin workstation, you instead generate it inside KMS and it lives there permanently and you can just send data to KMS to be encrypted or decrypted and access to the keys is controlled through AWS IAM. I don't love uh, things that use Amazon KMS, but sometimes it's cool to use for things. Uh, so Sneaker is one of the tools that builds on top of KMS. It uses uh, Amazon S3 as the storage backend. So again, you have to be running on AWS forever for always, but a lot of people are doing that, so it's okay. It's a command line tool, so that can be a little bit more difficult to use, but it's relatively simple to get started with. Uh, Confidant also uses KMS, but uses DynamoDB as the backend. And instead of being a command line tool, it's a little microservice with its own REST API, so that can be a little bit easier to integrate into other systems. Um, it's also got a nice little versioning system for uh, seeing when secrets change and why. Going back to command line tools, Trousseau is similar to Sneaker, but instead of using KMS for the key management, it uses GPG. Uh, I will mention the problem with GPG is by neckbeards for neckbeards, I say as the bearer of a neckbeard. It is possible to do broad and large scale automatic key distribution and management with GPG, but it's not easy. Expect to spend a lot of time looking at man pages and being mad at the internet. SOPS uh, is a little bit less featureful than the previous tools because it doesn't do storage management, but it does uh, allow using either KMS or GPG or both. So if you're running a hybrid infrastructure on Amazon and non-Amazon, this could be interesting. Red October from Cloudflare is a bit of a different beast. All the previous ones have really been optimized for hot or online secrets. Red October is built from the ground up for cold secrets. So uh, if you remember the old movies where you had to turn two keys to launch a nuclear missile, um, it's like that, but for uh, technology. So you can set up your key split to say you need two out of three or three out of five or five out of five of the key holders to unlock a given secret and you can customize that per secret. So for things that are high value but long-term storage, this can be very nice. Presented for completeness, Barbican was supposed to be the open stack equivalent to Amazon KMS. Uh, it is unfortunately pretty much dead at this point. I mentioned Conjure because it's the one I see the most, but this applies pretty universally to all closed source proprietary secrets management tools. Trust but verify. Um, be very wary when people come in claiming that this security tool will solve all of your problems. Always examine what is the, what is the underlying authentication mechanism, what is the, the uh, granularity of the audit logs, what's the granularity of the ACLs. And then the biggest gun in here, um, HSMs and their baby brothers, the TPMs. TPMs, if you're running your own hardware, they come on most modern server motherboards, um, but otherwise HSMs are hugely expensive, dedicated hardware. Amazon will happily lease one to you in the cloud for only $16,000 a month. Uh, but if used correctly, they are incredibly secure. The idea of an HSM is that it's a way of building one of those public-private key pairs, except the private key lives inside a chip. You cannot extract that private key short of dissolving the chip in acid and reading it out of memory with an electron microscope. That said, bugs in firmware are not unheard of, but relatively rare if used properly. If you go this route, expect to spend a lot of money on consultants. All right, throughout all of this, we keep dancing around the really hard problem of secrets management. Deep down, any secret management system needs to establish an identity relationship between the thing requesting secrets and the thing managing them. 
This is uh, in the parlance called secure introduction. So uh, I'm, I'm good, I'm not gonna do questions. Yeah, fine. Cool. Yep. Um, uh, usually bootstrapping this trust relationship boils down to I'm going to generate some kind of key or token and then I'm going to SSH and whoever answers SSH at IP 1.2.3.4, they are going to become identity X. By holding this token, they are who I think they are. If somebody else answered that SSH connection, you've you know, done an end run around the entire security model. That said, some clouds do have better techniques for secure introduction. So Amazon has the instance identity document, uh, Google Cloud has the cloud signature system, and Azure has the Azure Key Manager, all of which allow much sort of stronger concepts of server identity. And some tools, so like uh, HashCorp Vault, can now directly use the Amazon instance identity document for authentication. So you don't have to build your own system anymore for that. But a lot of the other things are not well integrated, like nothing really integrates with Google Cloud's uh, instance signatures. And if you take as a corollary, given that you have to do secure introduction, you have to come up with this identity management system, sometimes you can skip the secret parts entirely. Uh, MySQL, Postgres, and a lot of other internal tools will support using TLS client certificates for authentication directly. Uh, Public-private key pairs, the public key is not technically a secret because public keys are not radioactive. They do need to be handled very carefully. You need to make sure that you know, the public key you get from a, a machine is who it says it is when you get the public key and you record it and there's a, a, you know, a sort of chain of trust all along the way but it can be difficult in better ways because it's no longer quite as radioactive. You don't need to keep the public key database private or secret anymore. All right, let's talk quickly about integrations, uh, how to tie this into your applications. Uh, a whole bunch of the ones that I mentioned are some kind of service, so they run an API. The two main ones, HashCorp Vault has a library called HVAC, um, and KMS, and along with all the other AWS tools, has BotoCore, or Boto if you're on older versions of Python, I'm sorry. Um, and you can just use these directly, let's say you've got a Django settings.py, you can use HVAC directly. So connect to Vault from within your, your Django settings and just grab the password on the fly. Um, this is probably the easiest and most direct way, but relies on being able to change the source code. Uh, so for other tools, uh, you can integrate them in your config management layer, Salt, Puppet, uh, Chef, Ansible, whatever it is. Um, sometimes you'll use it for executing some of the CLI-driven things. Uh, other times you can pull you can pull data down in your CM tool and write it into template files, like into a local settings, whatever it is. Um, this is very flexible, but it usually requires differences depending on what sequence management tool you're using. Relatively unique feature of KeyWiz is this idea of KeyWizFS. It's a Fuse file system driver that acts as an API client for KeyWiz. This is great for dealing with TLS and other similar keys on things you don't want to modify, like say Nginx. You can point it to read its TLS uh, key and certificate out of KeyWizFS, so like slash keys slash foo.pem, and all of a sudden you don't have to change anything about Nginx, but it's reading its key file directly out of uh, KeyWiz without ever touching the disk. It's buffered in RAM, it's much safer to use, et cetera. So this is super cool if you've got a lot of uh, tools that you don't want to modify. Console templates is mostly useful if you're using HashCorp Vault. It was originally part of HashCorp Console, but it now works with, with both Console and Vault. If you're already using CM, it's very similar. It'll write data out to template files. This can be useful if you want to use uh, HashCorp Vault's auto rotation system. So it's changing the secrets at a higher interval or faster interval than you would be running your CM tool. Similarly, Env Console, I've mentioned that I don't like storing things in environment variables, but Env Console exists if that's a thing that you really need to do. And Summon is similar to Env Console. It takes secret data and shoves it into environment variables and then runs a subprocess. But it's got modular providers for a whole bunch of systems. I did mention that I don't love Conjure, but fortunately Summon is open source, so I can actually audit and make sure it's doing the right thing. All right, so in summary, uh, check your privilege and your audit trails, pick your types and temperatures of secrets, think about your attack surfaces, and have a disaster plan. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got like one, one, one or two questions. Okay, if you have a really, really good question that's suitable for being the only question we can ask Noah, please raise your hand now. Or just come talk to me afterwards. Speak I terrified up. the audience. It looks like we don't have any. Um, as a token of our uh, thanks for coming along here, we have this uh, wonderful sailing tram coffee cup for you. Thank you. Uh, everybody, please thank Noah for his uh, fantastic talk.